Hi everyone. Uh, I thought I'd talk today about what should we put in a first aid kit. So obviously um, I could put a whole ICU in here with crash cart and a mini hospital if I wanted to, but I don't want to have all that stuff all the time. I don't want to bog down the van when I'm camping. So what's like the minimum amount of things that I can bring that will actually be effective and useful and save a life, but also um, that doesn't just overload my van with a bunch of junk. So uh, the you know it'll depend a lot on uh, what you're doing, what adventures you're doing. Like if I'm going deep into the mountains, I'm going to obviously take a lot of different things than when I'm just driving around town. And uh, the kit I have in here right now is just sort of my around town kit, but. Um, yeah, if, I, if I'm doing like alpine climbing or trail running or something like that, I may have a few different things in here depending on the situation. So anyway, I'll just go through some things here. So so basically, I have everything in two little bags. Um, you can have a sea collar if you want, like this. Uh, but that's really only for, um, you know, if you're definitely not gonna have like an ambulance show up or something like that, usually you can just hold the head and stabilize the, the patient or stabilize the C-spine if you need to. Um, it's just that, uh, you know, randomly enough, I've encountered just a lot of accidents and uh, it seems like more than my fair share for the, for the short time that I have been driving around the road, so, you know, I've seen everything from major motorcycle accidents, head-on collisions, uh, street racing accidents, um, vehicle versus pedestrian, vehicle versus bicycle, all sorts of things that I've just been one or two cars behind uh, the, the event. And so, uh, first one on scene. And all of those, uh, I feel like I was able to save a life that otherwise, if it had just been five minutes for the ambulance to arrive, might not have survived. And so having this kit has been useful and I've modified it over the years. Um, so I'll just go through it here. So blue bag is intubation kit. And obviously for most people, you haven't done an intubation and a lot of things can go wrong in an intubation. So, um, and I don't even carry all the meds for a true, uh, for a true um, rapid sequence intubation, just because they would probably go bad just sitting in a hot van. So, um, so this is definitely not necessary, but some things that are also helpful are just oral airways to keep the airway open. So uh, if you haven't seen these before, it's different sizes based on, uh, you know, you can have really large for big guys and you just put it over the tongue, it helps hold the tongue in place so you can get airway, so you can get air moving through the airway. Um, I just have a little handle here, so uh, a couple different blades, a straight blade and a Mac blade. These will just hook on here so you can kind of open up the airway if you need to. Typically, um, you know, there'll be a lot of blood and everything, so uh, sometimes it helps to have a bougie. And all my tubes are up in here, so, you know, an 8.0 size tube for an adult, 7.0 for a female, um, and then there's a formula you can use for peds cases, peds trauma cases, but um, the most important thing for most people is not to have an intubation kit, but just to have a bag mask and an oral airway. So most of this kit um, you could ignore. <clears throat> I'll just put that off to the side. So the bag mask is in here. Now I'll just kind of go through these things as I have them in here. It's not necessarily ordered in any particular way, but um, So this is just kind of like standard first aid kit for my kids, like all the bandages, uh, blister kits, first or um, antibiotic appointment, a little super glue. Uh, so uh, you know, a lot of surgical wounds you can close with super glue. It's, it's literally just a cyanoacrylate. Usually it'll have a little um, gel-like molecule added on, like an octal uh, cyanoacrylate. But any super glue works to just close wounds and. Uh, actually can sterilize things too because it just freezes up the bacteria. Uh, but I also have a lot of uh, sterilizing kits in here so um, you can just have alcohol swabs which I have in there but chlorhexidine is actually a much better 
killer of bacteria and viruses, so I have a lot of chlorhexidine swabs in there as well. But that's kind of like your first, your general first aid kit. And, and maybe a couple other things I should point out in here is that, you know, band-aids are only so useful, so um, a lot of things that are actually more useful than that are telpha pads, especially like the island dressings. So an island dressing has a nice little bandage pad with a surrounding sticky part, so it just covers everything. And you can get them in all different sizes. I have like a six by six, or even like a four by 10 uh, to cover big road rash root wounds and things like that. So. Okay, um, I actually have another thing in here that says a uh, first aid kit. And uh, you know, these are just generic little first aid bags that I got at Target. But this one has a little bit more of casting materials, so um, let me bring up first. Uh, so I have uh, splinting materials, so this little orange thing unwraps and it's like a padded foil that you can basically mold into any splint for a broken limb or something, so at least you can stabilize an arm or a leg if you're transporting a, someone out of the field with, with a broken limb or broken bones. Um, they make these also in flat folded. Uh, I think I have one in here. Oh yeah, there it is. So this is a flat uh, splint that you can unfold and, and also splint uh, limbs and broken bones and things like that. And then uh, going back to this, so so um, I have the little stocking and the little padding and things like that, some gauze. So you just put that over a wound, or over a broken bone, sorry. And then um, the casting material just comes in little bags like this. Oh yeah, and there's some, you know, some self-stick wrap so you can just wrap gauze around wounds with that kind of wrap. Um, but this is the actual casting material. It's in these nice little bags that stay good for quite a long time. You just dip it in some water and lots of water storage under here. So you dip it in some water and then wrap it over the stocking and some padding. Pretty simple. You don't have to do a lot. This is just, you know, survive until they get out of the field into a hospital. So it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, okay. All right. A couple other things. So obviously some shears just to get clothes off quick. If someone has like a big rib cage wound or a uh, rib fracture or something like that and you want to just you know, see what the damage is and try to get a better sense of the patient's condition. I have just an old, uh, partially used, totally unsterile stapler for <laughs> closing head wounds really quick. Um, and, you know, nothing in the field is sterile. Even when we had patients come into the ER and uh, into the trauma bay, you know, yes, we would use IVs and all sorts of gear from the field. But ultimately, by the time they get to the ICU, you should have all that stuff out and have all new stuff that you know has been put in sterile. So you just automatically consider everything from the field to be unsterile. Um, all right. <laughs> and in line with that, I have a drill um, for all sorts of things, for um, any sort of osteotomies or any um, sort of craniotomies. So like a burr hole if someone is herniating a brain. Uh, if, if there's a brain herniation. Typically, uh, these would be in a case of like an epidural hemorrhage over the brain where the hemorrhage is rapidly progressing, compressing one side of the brain. And about 80% of the time, the burr hole should be on the side of trauma, on the side of the blown pupil. But um, you can never be for sure. So unless you're a neurosurgeon or a neurologist, uh, that's probably something you won't be doing, but it has saved lives and so um, that's why I keep that in there. I do have a sterile drill bit though that I would put on, but that's just for an example. Um, <clears throat> now, in the field, what do most people die of? Well, it's either airway or bleeding. So we talked about airway a little bit. Uh, hemorrhage, you know, in, in the military studies, they've shown that uh, typically the most preventable cause of death in the military at least, and obviously it's a little different conditions, but it's hemorrhage. And if you could stop these hemorrhages before, uh, you know, before they died and, and, and in time for someone to get there and stop the hemorrhage, that a lot of these soldiers would actually live. And so with that in line, I have a little tourniquet here. You wrap this around, twist this till it's tight. Pretty straightforward, easy. That's for a limb. And then I have 
just a lot of sort of hemostat stuff. So you can have these uh, these compression wraps, uh, Israeli bandages, some people call them, um, and just a general wrap, which you can use for a ton of things. This one doesn't get super tight though, usually not enough to constrict the limb or to constrict the artery, but uh, you can also have, there's all sorts of these absorbable hemostatic solutions. Uh, this one's just made out of cellulose. Uh, this Celox, it's like a hemostatic granule that you just dump on the wound, so it helps um, with clotting, rapid clotting basically of the wound. And so in a, in a dire situation where someone's just hemorrhaging out, that's the number one thing you can do. Now, I also have in here, if you know how to start IVs, it's really useful to have an IV kit. So um, typically in any trauma situation, you just want normal saline, so 0.9% sodium chloride. I have IV saline bags. These are just half a liter each, but you know, that'll get someone to the hospital at least if they need it. Um, and the IV lines here. I have just a sterile saline wash for washing out wounds. And then um, I also have a, well, you know, this dermaplast, this is sort of like a, it comes out cold and it also has um, a numbing agent and a sterilizing agent in it so you can sterilize road rash wounds and help them feel a little better. And, and then an antihistamine spray for bug bites and things like that. <coughs> Now, if you want, this is optional, you can have a snake bite kit or something like that. I do just because I have a lot of kids who explore rocks in the desert and um, I have that over here, just like something like this, like a little snake bite kit where it has a little scalpel, you can just cut the wound, suction out with the little suction device inside. Um, and yes, there's debate over whether <laughs> you should suction out wounds and things like that, but obviously that venom is very toxic it has all sorts of enzymes in it that cause all sorts of neuro and cardio toxicities and so getting as much of it out as you can is much better than worrying about um, a little blood loss and things like that so um, and then there's also another hemostatic solution just an aluminum aluminum chloride this is topical only but you can use this as well for stopping bleeding um, and, and if you really want you can get these cheap little pens on Amazon these little bovies just an electrical cauterizer basically um, so that's if you want to do surgery in the field. And then, you know, having some, some nice tools, um, little surgical tools. So these are just forceps, which are good for more than just pulling out splinters. Like if a kid is choking, sometimes you can even reach in, get something out of the airway with these. Um, they're not, they're not quite like the McGill forceps, which you would use for airway management in like an anesthesia sort of situation, but they're good enough. So useful for all sorts of things. Um, I'm gonna have like needle drivers for doing sutures. I have some sutures and scalpels and things in here. Um, you never know when that'll be useful. And so, you know, learning to do basic sutures uh, can be useful. And again, all you gotta do is get them to the hospital. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, I have this little wound spreader thing. So obviously these are in still sterile packaging, but um, it just kind of opens up the wound and clamps open. So. You can do whatever you need to do in the little wound area, whether it's irrigation or remove a foreign body or anything like that. Um, and then, obviously, I have some injectable medications. Now, you know, I could have all the advanced cardiac life support medications in here, but most of them would go bad sitting in the hot van. So, in general, um, I just keep the very, very basics, um, which is basically epinephrine and and antihistamine and a couple other things, but you don't need to go that fancy. So, um, pull that open over here. So, a little ephedrine syringe. Um, oh yeah, and a bunch of lidocaine. So you can either either squirt this um, topically on an injury, or if you're doing airway management, you know, since you're not doing a full rapid sequence intubation, you can actually just spray lido into the airway and uh, basically numb the airway enough that if you have someone with a low GCS, like unconscious patient, they're not gonna, you know, Valsalva and fight against you. Um, and that way you can intubate them like that. Okay, like I said, um, 
I have epinephrine in here, and that's not just for cardiac resuscitation. It could be good for anaphylactic shock or um, anything like that. So, uh, and then my my lidocaine, I have one vial that's just lidocaine straight. I have another one with epinephrine, which makes the lidocaine last a little longer. Uh, it's amazing how you know if someone breaks an ankle in the mountains and needs to get out, it, it, it's like you might just say it's a comfort difference with uh, numbing up the ankle or not and doing sort of a very basic nerve block on the ankle or just a, basically a local block around the ankle with the lidocaine with epinephrine but um, man that makes a difference in getting someone out of the field and uh, they're able to cooperate much better it's much less distressing and so uh, you know having having just a very basic needle and syringe and a little lidocaine can uh, make a huge difference in the stress level of a rescue situation. I also have just some ibuprofen. You can use naproxen as well. Um, another thing I have in here is Catorolac, which um, is a really strong form of basically ibuprofen. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So it's really great for an injury because you can just inject it intramuscularly near an injury and uh, it basically minimizes the pain. It actually has uh, almost like a morphine-like effect where it's comforting to the patient as well. I do not keep uh, narcotics in here just because of the risk of people breaking in or risk of them going bad. But in certain situations where I worry about high-risk scenarios or high-risk rescues, I can always throw that in my bag if I need to. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned, uh, these, um, <clears throat> these chlorhexidine the swabs are awesome for sterilization, uh, much better than just an ethanol or alcohol wipe. Like I said, I have all sorts of sizes of IVs in here, so uh, these are 20 gauge IVs. I have some 14 for really large resuscitations, some 16s, 18s, but 20 is pretty much good for most things. Uh, it's, it's considered a small IV, but you can get it in almost any kid, really, um, so I, I keep a lot of 20s. Um, and then, what else? Oh yeah, just some climbing tape. Tape is always useful for a whole bunch of things. And... Okay. Uh, gloves. It seems like every trauma, I run out <laughs> onto the street, these accidents, without gloves, and I come back with big bloody arms and shirts and things, and so I've realized by now need to have gloves here so that I don't get all bloody um, and then this is the bag mask kit I personally put in a bag mask for an adult and then um, a, sort of a 10 to 12 year old type age and then sort of an infant age as well so um, bag mask for all sizes there and those are really cheap 10 or 20 bucks so um, that'll keep someone alive long enough you don't necessarily need to go to full-blown intubation that's pretty rare actually unless they're, you know, completely traumatized and uh, have no ability to maintain the airway either from trauma or being unconscious or something like that. So, um, so yeah, that's why that's super useful. Now, just going through the stuff here. I have sutures in here. I think Vicryl is is a pretty good suture to have in general. If you have to buy one, just buy some like 3O Vicryl or something like that. It's big enough that it's strong, but small enough that it's not like super bulky and it's not braided so it's not as much at risk for infection and uh, that's a dissolvable one so if for some reason you uh, forget that you tied something off in the field it'll at least dissolve and less likely to get infected. Uh, okay, just a bunch of gauze and uh, some wipes, sort of some antihistamine wipes for bug bites which I talked about. I have a spray for that as well. Sterile scalpels, sterile scalpel and blade. Uh, another thing I forgot, one of the most important things I keep right in this front pouch, uh, a little pulse ox monitor. So, you know, if I really needed to, I can have a whole uh, cardiovascular monitor set up with blood pressure cuff or A-line, arterial line or whatever. But really all you need is just like a cheap $10 pulse ox. So this you can just put on the patient's finger and at least you have a heart rate and you have an oxygenation and so that's a lot more information than nothing. 
heart rate is especially useful. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't keep oxygen in here for uh, the bag mask or the intubation kit, I'm basically just using ambient air, but that's sufficient in most cases to at least keep, keep them oxygenated. So there it is, my pulse is 80 right now and my uh, saturation 95%. So that's super useful. Um, I can pull that out really quick for monitoring. And then another thing that actually I almost forgot about because uh, in the van I have blankets all the time, but you know, back before I just had a bed in here, um, a lot of the traumas that I came across, uh, motor vehicle traumas, were um, patients laying on a very hot, hot road. And surprisingly, some of those, like, no one has a blanket, no one has a towel. So just even having a basic thing like a blanket or a towel to put a patient on is immensely useful to prevent giant burns on uh, trauma patients. The other thing that a blanket is useful for is obviously if you're in the cold and you need to keep warm. And so even just a space blanket can be useful um, or a heavier blanket that you keep in the car in case you need to sleep in the car or uh, in case you need to bivy uh, in some unexpected scenario. So a blanket, like I said, can be useful for a lot of things. Okay. So, um, oh, one other thing that's useful as well is just a little suction. Sometimes you need to suck things out of a nose or if your kids get sick on a trip or whatever. Um, not necessarily that useful since it's not super strong suction, but it's not really worth keeping a big suction machine in the van either. So, uh, but the nice thing is like if I need to turn this into an ICU, I can. I have all my inverters and outlets and everything to run everything that I need. And so... <laughs> Uh, can convert this if I absolutely need to. But in general, uh, you can see that uh, emergency medicine and especially wilderness medicine and field rescue and all these sorts of things, the, the whole goal is to basi basically keep the patient alive long enough to get out of the field and to a hospital. And that primarily involves stabilizing the patient, keeping them from hemorrhaging, keeping them oxygenated and perfused. Uh, it's all about perfusion. Uh, you know, we keep coming up with these these numbers of you know how many compressions of the heart how many breaths and things like that a lot of that it, it doesn't matter that much what matters is that they're perfusing if they're not perfusing like if you're not circulating the blood and you're not oxygenating the blood then whatever numbers you're doing don't matter so um, it, it's all about uh, perfusing the organ systems and and keeping the patient alive as much as possible until you can get them to a more uh, advanced level of care so Hopefully that explains really quick, just off the cuff, uh, what's useful in a, in a trauma kit or an emergency medicine kit or a uh, first aid kit of, of any sort. And uh, you can just sort of think ahead for what uh, emergencies you might encounter and have the things necessary to deal with it in the field. And uh, I, I'm all about ultra lightweight, so as minimal as necessary that can still get the job done and that can still be useful in in those sorts of emergency scenarios. One other thing I forgot to mention is just what I put in my blister kit. So on here it says hydroseal band-aids, but that's not actually what's in here. Um, so I have a mole skin which you can cut to the shape of the blister, uh, preferably surrounding the blister uh, and then keeping a hole um, so you don't get a lot of compression in your shoe uh, against the blister itself, which hurts. But an even more effective thing is actually these benzoin uh, tinctures. So this is actually like a giant Q-tip. Uh, this is called a hot shot in the military. You basically take the benzoin, swab it around inside the blister, and it simultaneously disinfects, but also helps bring the uh, overlying skin back down to the dermis and stick it back together. It's sticky. And it actually, even though it, it, it is a hot shot, it hurts, um, it stings, uh, it actually afterwards seems to kind of numb things up a little bit too. So all around super effective. So. Um, so basically, take the benzoin, uh, swab it around the blister, and then cut your moleskin so it can surround the blister and uh, provide sort of a barrier while it's in your shoe. And you can put a protective layer over that, either a waterproof like Hydroseal Band-Aid or a Telfa with like an island dressing that sticks around it. And, and that's a pretty good insulative sort of layer for the uh, blister to protect it from pain or infection or things like that.